Well, as Brian said, it's good to see everyone here tonight. Uh, man, it's, it's very encouraging to see so many visitors from back home and from other congregations. And I want you to know that doing these gospel meetings is a great encouragement and it's the work of the Lord. But isn't it fun to be edified when you get to visit with brethren that you don't normally get to worship with and spend time together singing and praying and, and studying God's Word together? What a privilege it is. Tonight I want to talk about leaving Jesus in the temple. Leaving Jesus in the temple. And I hope the beginning of this lesson is sort of a segue into the, the main points of our lesson. And tonight we're going to have two main points. We're going to try to divvy up our, our time on those two points. For we spend most of our time thinking about ways that we are guilty of leaving Jesus in the temple. If you remember back in the New Testament, Joseph and Mary made the mistake of leaving Jesus in the temple. Let's turn there and read that in Luke chapter 2. I want to read Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 49 to open us up here. Luke 2, starting at verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold. Thy father and I have sought you, sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you have sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So what we see here is Jesus was left in the temple by his parents. Uh, I, I did this lesson before. And when I did this lesson after the service, there was a lot of people after service. I don't know that they got much out of the lesson. But they, they remember this point and said, you'll never believe this, but I left my kid at the building one time growing up. Or One guy actually claimed he left his wife there, and his wife had a good story about that. So maybe you've got uh, the same situation where you've left somebody at the building before on your way home. Monica and I actually have our own story for that, too. She was heavy pregnant, and I left her at the building one day and genuinely didn't even know I did it. Until I was getting out of home, my, my other daughter was crying and said, just scratch said, quieten down. I finally looked back, and I'm like, where is Monica? And so... Uh, Monica will tell you the rest of that story later. She'll give you the Paul Harvey version uh, later on. But just as we see Jesus left in the temple, I, I think there's a, a real application here. I feel like one of the things as Christians that we have a habit of is when we're here on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesdays or whatever time the local church meets, tonight we're here on a Monday night, you know, we're all excited, encouraged, and focused on growing as Christians, being faithful Christians, setting an example living the life that a Christian should, and we're sort of motivated. We're excited about it. It's something we're passionate about. But sadly, what happens sometimes is when we leave the building, some of that zeal and excitement of carrying out the work of the Lord and being this light and this example, it starts to fade a little. Not intentionally, it just happens. And the more it happens, the more we get comfortable with it. So what I want to try to do tonight is see how at times when we are gathered together and we're motivated to tell us for the Lord that we can take that with us outside of this building and just ask ourselves, do we leave Jesus in the temple? And again, two points. And the first one I want to talk about is our conversation about spiritual things and salvation. So let's just stop and think about that real quick. When it comes to talking about salvation Talking about being a Christian, talking about spiritual things, how much of that do you do at this building? We're, we're going to, you know, meet street building or wherever you're a member. I know we have people from everywhere tonight. But how much they go, so, well, Trey, at Piney Grove, that's about all we talk about. After services, we may talk about the weather. We may talk about our favorite football team or politics or something like that, right? But while we're at the building, our general conversation is focused around Christ, our Lord, and spiritual things. Fair enough. We sing and edify and teach through song. We pray. All these things are focused around spiritual things. But now, honestly, I'm asking you to do something right now. When you're not at this building, honestly, when you're at work, when you're at school, when you're at home, how much talking goes on about the Bible, about spiritual things? And I, I say that because of myself and with my wife and my children or my family. How much do we talk about spiritual things outside of this building? 
Some of the greatest opportunities I've had to talk to other people about the Bible and visit other Christians and get to know other people has not been from meeting them at a church building, but people, people I've met at work, people I've met through my business and, and doing things like that. That's some of the greatest opportunities I've had. But if we don't talk about these things, those opportunities are going to be very limited. And that's really where I want to focus at with this first point. In Luke 2, Jesus was left in the temple, and what he was doing there was discussing his father's business, just like we do. While we're gathered in the church building, we discuss God, his word, salvation, spiritual matters. And as I said, when we leave the building, sometimes that changes. But it didn't change for Jesus. Now follow me here. For Jesus, it didn't change. If you notice on the screen there, I'm not going to turn all these passages because this part of the lesson is just to get our minds there. But he goes out, he's, he's on a mountain. In Matthew chapter 5 uh, through 7, one of the greatest sermons that we see in Scripture, he's talking about his father's business, he's talking about spiritual things. Then we see him by the seaside in Matthew 13. What's he doing? He's talking to people about God and spiritual things. When he goes into their houses in Matthew 13, verses 36, 37, same thing. He's along the coast in Matthew 19. How many of you vacation at the coast? You ever done that? You ever went to the beach for vacation? I think maybe we discussed that tonight. Somebody had mentioned they'd take, taken some girls to the beach. Hey, have you ever thought, all right, we're going to the beach, and we're going to talk about scripture. Like, that's part of the vacation plan. I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think that's natural. I don't think people generally say, hey, let's go down the coast, and while we're sitting out there, you know, enjoying the weather and listening to the ocean, we're just going to talk. We're, this, this year, we're going to study Luke on the coast. This year, while we're on the beach, I, I don't genuinely think like that with my family, and I'm not sure... Here's Jesus. He's on the mountain. He's at the coast. He's in people's houses. What's, what's on his mind? He's constantly focused. He's constantly thinking about heaven. He's been there before. He came down from heaven and made himself lower than angels so that he could be our Savior. When he was on the cross at 33 years old and he was crucified, did you say, did you hear any, did Jesus say, hey, the life expectancy for people in Israel are, are Nazareth or Jerusalem or people that are born in Bethlehem is like 77 years old and I'm 33. I, this is not a fair life. Please give me a few more years, God. You know, I, I haven't fulfilled. I wanted to go see all 50 states. I haven't even been to North America yet. Did you hear Jesus say anything like that? Because he knew where he was going. And if we had ever been to heaven, we could simulate in our mind how great heaven is. Maybe there's times when we wouldn't be so caught up in this earth to say, I'm not ready to leave it. Maybe we'd be more, I'm ready. Lord, I'm ready. I'm prepared. Whenever you need me, when my business is done, sir, take me. He's constantly focused and talking about these things. Well, what happens with us is we get focused on our jobs. We get focused on our life. And just tonight at supper, we were talking about college football, talking about sports. And there's nothing sinful about those things. But what I'm suggesting is as Christians, maybe we're missing a lot of opportunities. We're missing a lot of chances to spread the gospel, to build up our faith and the faith of others, by not talking and having conversations and spiritual talks outside of this building, outside of the temple, when we have opportunity. So, as we end that question, how much do you talk about Jesus, the Bible, <coughs> sin, spiritual matters outside of when you assemble with the church? And that's when you can just answer, well, not a lot. Or actually, we do talk about it a lot. Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you can say, hey... This is something that my family or I do a great job at, and that's commendable. But in a lot of homes of Christians, it would be an honest assessment to say, we fell at this. We don't do as good a job as we should. Let's look at some passages here. Turn with me to Mark chapter 16 at verse 15. Mark 16 at verse 15. And he said unto them, go into all the world. Do you know what I didn't read right there? Go into every church of Christ church building and preach the gospel to every creature. Did you notice the difference in what the scripture said and what I said? He said go into all the world, not every church of Christ church. But now, obviously, we're going to preach it within the temple. You know, the buildings we meet at today where we assemble. And when Jim goes to Africa, the temples might look a little different over there. The tents or the buildings they've constructed. But it, the word of God's going to be preached. But what's, what about outside of these locations? How much conversation is happening outside of these places? Because Christ said go into all the world. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, this may be the best Old Testament passage for this. Turn with me back to Deuteronomy. We've been doing a study of Deuteronomy at Piney Grove lately, so this is very fresh on my mind. In Deuteronomy 6, start with me at verse 6. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, 
And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by your way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. So for a living, if you're not familiar with what I do, I buy livestock for a living. And there's a, a Mennonite community in Hartsville, Alabama I have to go to several times a year to pick up goats and sheep and cattle. And when I go and pick them up, every house in this community, their mailbox has this square on it for a Bible verse. Maybe you've seen something like this before. But in this community, every mailbox has one. And it's really cool just to ride down and say, and I'm thinking right, every day their kids and them are driving down these roads and they're seeing those signs. So that verse is, they think about that verse every day. And guess what? Once a month they change out the verse. Once a month they change out the verse. Okay? So there's this constant seeing these verses. When you read that passage, when you sit down, when you lie down, when you're walking in your way, my dad and mom brought me services all my youth growing up and, and taught me the scripture and were a great example. But another thing my dad did a good job at was, was what I do for a living. He would take me to the cell barn. And when the cow would come in, he would say, what kind is that? And I would say, Angus. And he would say, what is that, Charlotte? That's a Santa Gertrude's, you know, uh, a Jersey or a limousine. And then he would show that off. He would be around some other people and say, hey, tell me what kind of cow it is. You know, because at four or five years old, I knew cattle better than most adults because I'd been trained that way. We talked about it. We saw it. It was on our mind. We'd go home. We'd look at the cows in the pasture. That's something that meant something to my family and me. And maybe you have things like that in your mind that meant something to you and, and you were trained in a way and you just were educated and you know that stuff, like the back of your hand, working on them GMC trucks or Chevrolets you were telling me about earlier. You know more about it than I do. And that's what happens. Uh, Trey does the woodworking with it, with his furniture business. Don't ask me to come help. I'll just cut something in half that don't need to be cut. I can go ahead and tell you if I can not cut myself in half. But that's the idea is we have things we talk about and discuss in our homes. The Johnson family, they know Mississippi State football. The, the parents went to Mississippi State. They know a lot more about it than I do. And that's something that's important. At my house, it's going to be the Gators, right? So that's what we do. What about these spiritual things? How much do I go home with my 13-year-old daughter, my 10-year-old daughter, my 4-year-old son, and it's before we go to bed, let's talk about something that happened in the Old Testament. Let, let's practice in our prayers. Why do we not go to some of these things that, that are happening at your school and what's the purpose of this? What can we learn from this? Why do, we, why do we do this in our worship services? There can be more conversation about these things other than the few hours we're in this building. And I feel like myself, as Paul would say, first and foremost, and other Christians, we fail at this. We're guilty of leaving Christ at the temple when it comes to conversation about <laughs> salvation and spiritual things outside of church buildings, essentially as we're using it as a synonym here for the temple. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, look what Peter has to say here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Hey, every time somebody asks you, Hey, why do y'all not use instruments in your worship service? Well, we don't see an example of that in the New Testament. We don't see any church doing that or, or any command or authority or inference or anything there for that. So why would we do that? And then maybe they say, well, why do you believe baptism is such an important part of salvation? Well, we see that when people obey the gospel. They were added to the Lord's church through Christ's blood as they put Christ on through baptism as we sing Galatians 3. And I'm afraid a lot of times as Christians, we're not ready. I'm not suggesting we should memorize every verse of the Bible or, or we can give an answer to every question. But when it comes to our faith and our salvation, the simple stuff, we should be able to give an answer for that. When it comes to our hope, we should be able to give an answer for that. Amen. And when you think about the friends at school, our co-workers, they're going to have questions about our faith. I know it's happened to you if you are faithful. And what a great opportunity to spread the word of God or to be a light. And that could help lead a soul to the Lord. But we've got to do a better job of having conversations about these things outside of this building. Go with me to Mark chapter 5. In Mark 5, let's read verses 19 and 20 this time. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to your friends. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says here, okay? Go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for you and has had compassion on you. And he departed him again to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. Do you see that passage? How many times have you went to work or school after a Sunday and said, we had the best worship service yesterday. Someone was baptized in Christ. Their sins were forgiven. Someone was restored. 
The singing was great. I'm so thankful for the, the family I get to worship with at the local church. How many times does that happen? How many times have you went to your friends, just as we see here, and, and established, communicated to them, I'm so thankful for the sacrifice of Christ. I'm so thankful for my brethren in Christ. I'm so thankful for whatever you can think of from the, the, the Word of God and the blessings of God, the greatest gifts we've been given, and share that amongst others. Publish that amongst <laughs> others, as we see here. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 71. Psalm 71. Read with me verses 15 and 16. Notice what the psalmist writer says here. Let's read verse 5 and 6. I'm sorry, that should be verse 5 and 6. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holding up from thy womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continuously of thee. If God is our hope, if he is our trust, if we're that impressed with us, don't you think we would share that with others? The psalmist writer, in so many of these chapters, the psalmist writers, express their thankfulness and love for what God has done for them. What about us? That will mean Psalm 66. Turn back to Psalm 66 at verse 16. Listen to what he says. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my son. I don't know, after I obeyed the gospel when I was a 10th grader in high school, I was 16, I don't know how many times I was declaring that to others. I don't know that that was the first thought on my mind. But you know when something else good happens? You know, if you're walking down through Walmart and you find a $20 bill, you know, do you tell us, do you tell somebody about that? Man, I had a great day. You have some great luck. Hey, my favorite team won the game. We're so excited. We just got great news. We share that. How much great news do we share from the Word of God with others? Because the greatest news we've ever gotten is, is here. But I don't know how often we, we approach it that way. And share it that way. And talk about it continuously. And then one more verse in Psalm. Psalm 96 at verse 3. Psalm 96 at verse 3 says, Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among the people. Do you notice who he said declared among? Did he say declare his word among all the righteous people that love God? He said among the heathen. I would say that those aren't the righteous people that feared love the Lord at that moment. And then at the end of that verse, there in verse 3, he says, in his wonders among all people. I feel like there's been opportunities in my life where I failed there that I want to do better in the future. I want to have more conversations about spiritual things and salvation outside of the temple. I don't want to just leave Jesus in this temple when it comes to the good news, when it comes to the hope and all the good things I know about God. I don't want to just leave it here in the temple. What about you? As we end this first point, can you say that you've been guilty of leaving Jesus in the temple when it comes to conversation about spiritual things and salvation? The next time you're at work or at school or wherever you have a chance, you know, you don't just jump into conversation sometimes, but a lot of times if you're good at picking up cues in conversation, there's opportunities to bring these things up. There's opportunities to slide these things in. Today, I was at the stockyard and we were eating lunch, and I had on my gator shirt, and a, a lady just... I don't, I've never seen her before. And she said, go Gators. Of course, what I said, go Gators. I, I like this person already. You know, we got something in common. So I sat down to eat. And she said, are you from Florida? I said, no, I'm from North Alabama. She said, well, my parents were in Florida. They're huge Gator fans. My brother's a big Gator fan. They love the Gators. I said, so do I. So we started talking. And she said, did you go last year to watch them in Tuscaloosa and basketball? And I said, they played on a Wednesday night. I said, every year we played Alabama. It's on a Wednesday night. The closest, one of the closest games. I said, we can't miss Bible study to go to a basketball game. So we just can't do it. I want to go, but that's not the priority of our life. And immediately she said, where do y'all worship? Where do you work? Like immediately she knew there was some faith there. So there's those opportunities to get in those conversations, to talk about these things. <clears throat> the second way I want to talk about leaving Christ in the temple tonight is when it comes to our pricked hearts and resolutions. And I really hope you'll focus on this point. You know, I've been to funerals. I would say the funerals are one of the top places where your heart is bricked and your conscience and your mind is really at ease and you're thinking about, just as Felix did, you're, you're thinking about righteousness and judgment and, and things to come. You know, that house of mourning can do a lot for us. 
But I just remember growing up before I became a Christian, right before I became a Christian, hearing the Word of God preached. And before I was baptized, there was a period there for maybe weeks, maybe a few months. I can't really give you a perfect time there where I knew I need to obey. I need to be. I need my sins washed away. You know, I knew that. And, and I didn't do it that moment. And I'm not suggesting it was the worst thing in the world because it gave me time to think and truly understand what I was doing. But it was on my mind. But as soon as I could get out of the building and that lesson that maybe pricked my heart or stepped on my toes, whatever lingo you want to use there, as soon as I could get out and I could go back to thinking about school or ball or whatever was happening in my life, I could let it go. Does that make sense? You know, you could let it go. And I think today we've got a lot of people in these audience where there's this feeling like, I need to go forward tonight, and I need, I need to get my life right. I have not been living right. Other people know it. I know it. What would be holding me back from just making that move, of making sure the most important relationship I have with God, with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, I want to get that. Why would I not take that step? If I know I need to be baptized with Christ, if I know I need to apologize and make something right with someone, if I know there's a sin in my life I need to repent of, maybe it's private, why would I not say, hey, this is of the utmost importance. While my heart is pricked, while this is on my mind, why would I leave that at the temple? Here I am in this building, and I'm thinking, tonight's the night. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to be a member of the Lord's church, and I want to know that when I lay my head down tonight, I'm ready to meet my Savior. And that's going to be the goal the rest of my life. Why, why would I not take care of that? Because what happens is, is we've built up this immunity or this hardened heart, closed ears, closed eyes where we can leave and we can sort of leave that at the temple. Next time we're back, well, there it is again. Uh, you know, Mr. Henderson did a lesson that got me again. You know, there it is. Brian did a lesson at, at Meek Street at Bill down at Field Campbell and I, 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 I should have done it. I don't know what I'm waiting on or I've got to get rid of the sin in my life. I've got to make some changes. I've got to start putting God first. We've got to start taking the assembly with the saints more serious. Whatever it is, we're bad about leaving those things at the temple. You know, you, you do a lesson on forsaking the assembly, and there's three or four people there, maybe, <coughs> wish I could say zero there, that have trouble with forsaking the assembly. And you think, this, they heard it. They were here. They, they'll be here tonight. They'll be back Wednesday. You know, you just feel that confidence. It's like, how could they not after hearing that? And then they're not back. They got out of here. They got off their mind. And they left that, that great lesson. The word of God had touched their heart sharper than a two-edged sword. And they left it there. <coughs> and here's the thing. We can all be guilty of that in some facet of the word of God in our lives. If you have days when... After Brian or the preacher at your local church has done a great lesson, maybe in the Bible class, or, or somebody said something during a prayer or the sermon, maybe you saw someone else obey the gospel and your heart was pricked. And you tell yourself that you're going to do nothing. You're going to work on some of these resolutions in your life. But what happens is you end up leaving those things at the temple. That's like, you know, I say, I'm going to go on a diet, or maybe we say something, I'm going to exercise more. And then, you know, as Johnson pulls out a coconut, a coconut cake, you say, I'm starting that tomorrow. And then you know what will happen. Tomorrow somebody's going to have a coconut pie. And you say, well, I'm starting that Wednesday. And then my wife brings home, you know, Krispy Kreme. Buy a dozen, get a dozen for $2. Go ahead, buy them. You know, and then she brings that on. I'm like, well, we'll start this weekend. And, and that's what happens spiritually with these things. We'll, we'll just start later. We'll take care of that later. And we see what happened with Agrippa and Felix in the book of Acts. Agrippa was almost persuaded. Felix said would have more convenient time. And we don't see in Scripture that for either one of those that, that happened. Look with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. I'm convinced you've saw this verse before. But in the thought of tonight's lesson, consider this passage when it comes to our pricked hearts and resolutions. Peter and the apostles preaching to, the, to these Jews that have crucified Jesus. After they're done, listen to the crowd's response. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What do we need to do? And they did it. Over 3,000 souls were at the Lord's church. They were baptized after he told them to repent and be baptized for the mission of their sins. Tonight, maybe you're here and there's something in your life that you need to do. But you've been leaving that at the temple. When you're here, you know it. When you leave here, you forget. Or maybe you have brought it with you and you just haven't done anything about it. Let's be like them, uh, the Jews here in Acts 2. Let's do something about it right away. The ones that did. 
In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, you see this verse on the screen there, but notice what the Hebrew writer says. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joint of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Someone who is serious about getting to heaven that has a fear of God and believes in God, when you open up God's Word and you truly read and study it, maybe in the past you haven't been that focused on it, but maybe you are now, it can really cut to your heart and your conscience. And it can cause you to say, listen, if I'm an honest person, I know I have not been living right. I know there's something I need to do. The difference is, is taking this lesson and saying, I'm not leaving that at the temple tonight. I'm going to do it. I'm going to start applying this. This is going to make a change for me. Versus, uh, I know I need to do something, but I'm just going to leave that at the temple. And I'm not sure we say it like that, but that's sometimes how we do it. Many times, after our heart has been pricked or cut, we make that resolution. To repent, no pain. But it doesn't happen. So now the question is, why not? Why does it not happen? Why do we leave this attitude and this zeal? I think, why does that happen? Go with me to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8. Look with me at verses 8 through 15. Now look, I'm going to set you up here to tell you this. We should be reading a lot of this to make the full point, but I'm going to paraphrase because it will get the point. But what you've got here is Pharaoh, who has these Israelites in Egyptian bondage. And God sends these ten plagues. You remember water to blood, frogs, lice, flies, death of cattle bulls, hell, locusts, darkness, death of the first one. He starts with that water to blood, and then he goes to frogs. That's what we're going to pick up. Start in verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice to the Lord. Listen to what he says. These frogs are killing us. Go to God and tell him, I'll let his people go worship him. Just get rid of these frogs. At that moment, Pharaoh is saying, ha, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to let him go. That's sort of like somebody today saying, God, I know I've been living wrong and I've got myself in financial trouble. My health is bad. I've lost my friends and my family. But if you'll help me, I'll start serving you. I'll turn my life around. You can imagine someone going through that conversation with God. And maybe their life gets a little better. And they start going to services or they start to, but then as soon as things get a little bit, all of a sudden they forget God. Notice what happens. And Moses said to Pharaoh, glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the river only? And he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you and from your house and from your servants and from your people and they shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses had cried. Moses cried to the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. Now listen to this next verse. And they gathered them together upon heaps in the land stand. You ever drove through somewhere on the interstate or the highway? And my kids would be the first one. What is that smell? You know, you're going through like an industrial area or a dump or something, and you, and you smell something like... Can you imagine this heap of dead frogs? I really don't know if I can imagine it. I, I've had frog on my hand and you smell that. Oh, that's rough. So imagine a heap of dead frogs. But look at verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, all of a sudden the frogs are gone. Things are just, they're better for now. It, it, that problem is deceased to take care of. He hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. You see, that's what happens with Christians a lot. Is as soon as something in our life gets a little better, for some reason so many forget God. All those gifts and blessings the Lord has served upon us, they start to dissipate in our mind and the world starts to tug at us again. Whatever that temptation or sin, maybe we're drawn back in or that love of, the, of this world starts to get to us. If you stay in the same chapter there of Exodus chapter 8, I want to just show you a few more examples of this to see how it progresses. In uh, verses 31 and 32, and the Lord did according to the, the word of Moses, and he removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. <coughs> there remained not one. Now here we go again. Pharaoh said, if you'll just do this, huh? And then Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. There he goes again. Look at chapter 9, verses 34 and 35, trying to get towards the end of this. 
And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoke by Moses. Over and over and over. And you know, I look at that just like I do a lot of Bible stories and say, I, I wouldn't be like Cain. I wouldn't be like David. I wouldn't be like... And then you look at Pharaoh and say, I, I wouldn't be like Pharaoh. How many times do we do the same thing? Where we just harden our hearts over and over. We callous up. We don't let the word of God do what it should. Let's look at a few more passages and the lesson will be yours. Turn with me to Matthew 13 at verse 15. Matthew chapter 13 at verse 15. For the people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. It's like every time we meet, there may be some of that audience that the Lord is trying to work on that he's been long-suffering with that his patience and mercy and grace continue to be bestowed upon. And it's like maybe this is the night that something's going to happen and change in their life. And what happens? The, the more we harden our heart and close our ears and our eyes and callous up, the harder it is it for something to happen to make change in our life. In Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews, the third chapter. Turn with me there. Look at verses 13 through 15. He says, But exhort one another daily, and while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made protectors of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast then. Do you hear that? We've got to be faithful through that journey. Not just when we obey the gospel, but we've got to maintain that faithfulness to the end. If you don't believe that, read about those seven churches in Asia. Where he says, be thou faithful unto death. Keep this up. Verse 15 says, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the propagation. You know what I take out of that verse? Hey, I know I need to obey the gospel. Today's the day. What else would we wait on? What could change if you know you know? Right? I need to repent. Today's the day. I need to make some simple changes in my life and our prioritizing in our family of our time, our schedule, our lifestyle. Today's the day. Right? Why, why would you wait? You go home, you open your door, and there's a bear in your house. Do you say, well, let's just leave it for a week or two? I mean, you don't do that, right? You say, well, we've got to be, this has got to be fixed. Why? My wife, our sockets, for some reason our house, our sockets, you plug it in, it's sort of like, it's not, don't hold in there good. Very loose sockets. She said, can you please fix this? I, Today's not the day, right? You know, because it's, it's continuously there. It's a problem. But if we go in and there's a foot of water in our house, like, yeah, today's the day. We sort of prioritize, you know, emergencies and problems. A spiritual thing is a real emergency. It's not a minor problem. Your soul eternally in heaven versus eternally in hell, that's a priority. That's a today thing. That's a now thing. That's why when someone comes forward and says, I want to become a Christian, we don't say, well, look, we're going to have baptism day in four weeks. And then we're, you know, we're going to have the water ready. It'll be warm. You know, we'll bring, we'll call all your parents and grandparents. We'll get everybody here. We'll do that. Because it's an urgent matter. Salvation is an urgent matter. Look at a, uh, a couple more passages. Stay there in Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse 7 this time. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. Again, now listen to this. He limits a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you, will know, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. There is a limit of opportunities we have to become a Christian, to get our life right, to be faithful. There's a limited amount of time we have on this earth to do the work of the Lord, to serve God, and to be ready to meet him. And we don't know that limit. For each one of us, it may be very different. But we have today. So don't waste that limited amount of time, whether becoming a Christian or carrying out your role as a Christian. Turn with me one more time to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice what Paul says here to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6. Look at verse 2. For he says, I have heard thee in an ex a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I suffered thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now. Are you guilty of having a pricked heart or resolutions in your life that you need to make and leaving that stuff at the temple? Leaving those resolutions, 
leaving that zeal and that passion to make your life right, are you guilty of leaving it there? In Proverbs 20, verse 14 on the screen, it says, Blessed is the one who always fears God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Are you guilty of leaving Jesus at the temple? When it comes to conversation about spiritual things and salvation, when it comes to resolutions and pricked hearts and obedience, are you guilty of leaving those things at the temple? How much do you talk about your salvation, your hope, your faith outside of this building? With your family, with your children? You know, Thanksgiving's coming up, Christmas's coming up. How many times did those get together for those conversations brought? <coughs> it don't have to be just then, but any opportunity you have. What about these pricked hearts and resolutions? Are you guilty of leaving those things at the temple and not bringing them with you? I want to tell you a story to end the lesson. I hope you'll listen closely. I have a friend named Nate, and he's big into adult softball. Now, maybe some of y'all played adult softball after high school or college age. Mm -hmm. And so he called me and said, look, we need some players down in Russell. This is about 10 years ago, maybe longer than that, maybe 12. But I was in, in college age. And so he said, we need to, could you come play a few games? So I said, yeah, that'd be fun. So in this adult softball league, they play 10 at a time on the field rather than nine, okay, to make it a little more competitive. So there's four outfielders. I guess you could put them in any position, but we had four outfielders. So I'm playing left center field, if you're visualizing this, okay? And there's a guy right here in right center field beside me who I've never seen before. I don't remember his name. But the person batting hits a mile-high pop-up. Now, you, you know, a softball's a big ball. And he hits it a mile high. And this guy's under, I got it, I got it, I got it. And I'm standing here, you know, 10 feet from me. And he's yelling, I got it. That softball comes down. I'm talking about just as square on his forehead as it could possibly do. I'm talking about just a knockout blow. And, you know, the ball goes over there. We throw it in, play sort of over. And everybody's, you know, worried about this kid. He's like 19, 20-year-old young man. Everybody's worried about him. And we got there, oh, it, it hit my glove. It, 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 it rubbed my glove a little bit. It didn't really hit me in the face. Okay, you know. So we get the last out, we go to the dugout. You know how sometimes after something like that happens, it takes a little moment for things to happen? We get to the dugout, and everybody's worried about this guy. Man, are you okay? His, his girlfriend's over there, you know. All, Man, are you sure you're okay? Yeah, it hit my glove, it didn't. There is a softball tattoo on his forehead. <laughs> I promise you, you couldn't have, you couldn't have purposefully drawn or painted a softball on his forehead any better than it was. And he sat there and said, "Oh, it didn't even hit my head." And we're like, "Okay, <laughs> somebody get this guy a mirror, <laughs> show him his forehead, so he doesn't look so foolish again." Because we all see it, but he don't see, he, you know, he don't see it. And I think that's this lesson right here. Maybe at times in our life, everybody sees it. You need to make some changes. You need to repent. You need to be baptized. You've got to be a better Christian for the local church part of it. And everybody sees that but you. You're like the guy that got hit by the softball, and it's right there, plain to stand. Everybody sees it but you. It's like somebody show them. Help them to realize that. I hope tonight that you can look in the mirror. And if in any way you've been leaving Christ at the temple when it comes to your morals, your thoughts, your conversations about spiritual things and salvation, your pricked hearts, your resolutions that you're going to do better with your children and your home and your family, or helping the local church, or growing individually, spiritually, or whatever goals you've got spiritually, I hope tonight you can look in that mirror and you can say, I've got to quit leaving Jesus at the temple. I've got to do better. And now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And I hope you realize there's a group of people around you that want to support you, that want to hug you and lead you and say, hey, if tonight's the night, we've got all the time in the world. Let's see you baptized in Christ. Let's pray for you. Let's see you restored and help. Let us do, after you've done it, let us help encourage you. It doesn't end there. And there may be a time where you're on the other side of things and it's you that needs that encouragement. It's you that needs that help. But while you're here tonight, knowing what we've just read in the scripture about now is the day of salvation, now is the time, if you have any need, maybe you need to become a child of God or you need to repent or you would like some further Bible study or prayer from some of the saints here, we would all love to assist you and help you in any way that we can. So as we sing this song of invitation, don't leave that pricked heart or those resolutions here at this building. Take care of those things and let us help you do that. The Lord limits the time, but you have now. And we would love to help you. If we can help in any way, please come as we sing, stand us in the song. That's been <coughs>